Hi, Carl. Could you please start off our interview today with a little bit of an introduction about yourself and in learning and development in particular? Sure, uh, and thanks for asking me to do this, Guy. Um, my, I'm Carl Binder, I'm CEO of the Performance Thinking Network. I really got my start 40 years ago as a student with B.F. Skinner. I applied what we learned from Skinner in instructional design early on for about 10 years and produced what we called fluency-based instruction. And I'll refer back to that a little bit later. And then I moved into the corporate training world and we did a lot of work with sales and customer service and other areas where being fluent was critically important. And then in the early 90s, really moved into performance improvement with a broader perspective, uh, really in, um, uh, influenced strongly by Tom Gilbert. And then basically we've evolved by taking his work and making it very plain English, but learning is a big part of what we still focus on. So that's a little bit about me. Well, thank you for that, Carl. Now for our main event, could you please give us your take, five, 10 minutes, 15 minutes on what and how to measure the impact of instruction in okay. enterprise learning and development? Okay, so I'm going to, I'm actually going to use a couple of visuals here. So I want to use a little visual here because we talk a lot about measuring performance more broadly, not just the effect of learning, but of all the interventions we might do. Uh, in a particular project or intervention. And so we use a model that we call the performance chain that you can see in, in front of you. It's a very simple model. It comes from Tom Gilbert's work originally, although we renamed some things in it. And so what we say is that performance has three elements. People behave, there's behavior, there's activity. It produces what we call work outputs, which is the phrase we use to refer to accomplishments, the valuable things that people produce. And those are valuable because they contribute to organizational or business results or possibly societal results. So when we analyze performance or teach other people to do so, we're always breaking performance into those three elements at the sort of micro level. I mean, we're talking about outputs being things like decisions or relationships or widgets or documents, things that are valuable that contribute to the organization. And so one of the things that we do when we teach measurement is we say, you can measure all three of those things. And once you've analyzed the hunk of performance, we can measure the behavior, we can observe people, we can use checklists, we can count the number of times they do something, we can see if they use their protective gear or not, we can do all these things around behavior if we want. Uh, we can also measure business results, and we may or may not be doing so, but hopefully our clients are looking at things like revenue or customer satisfaction or market share or quality and so forth. But what we think the real opportunity is, is in work outputs or um, what Gilbert would have called accomplishments. And for us, work outputs, we, were, we describe as countable nouns. They're things that you can count and you can define whether they're good or not. So whether it's a relationship or a decision or a widget, whatever the output is, we can say, here's one and it meets certain criteria that we can define. So it's either a good one or it's not. And so what we suggest is that any measurement framework that you're using to monitor and decide on the impact and decide whether you have to make changes can be some combination of these three things, depending on what available, what data are available, uh, how easy it is to get, how often you can get the data and so forth. But there's some interesting issues in there. One of them is that business results measures are usually lagging indicators. That is, you don't get the data very often. You may get them quarterly. You might get some monthly data. In some environments, like customer call centers, you may get productivity data on an hourly basis or daily basis, in which case it's not so much of a, of a lagging indicator. But typically, business results are lagging indicators. So we want to be able to show impact. But the challenge is, if we don't have enough data points, there's, you can't make decisions very often. So measure business results, but recognize that they don't give you a robust or simple way to be able to make decisions day to day, week to week, and so forth. You can measure behavior also, but doing so as anybody who's done it for real is costly. We're not just talking about asking the manager whether people's behavior changed or not, which is refined opinion as one of my colleagues used to call it. We're talking about either observing people with something like a behavioral checklist or observing people with perhaps uh, just counting how many times people do something, 
Um, and we may be doing that, for example, in a call center for feedback or diagnosis where we say, okay, every so often we're going to sit down with you and look at a recorded session and use a behavioral checklist and decide whether you did it or not. Or in sales, we might be in an environment where the manager goes in and says, well, I've got this checklist. I'm going to ride with you today and I'm going to check out the behavior you do or don't do. And that's good. And it's really helpful both as feedback when you're trying to develop people. For example, let's say you do training and then you put a feedback tool in the hands of the manager and the manager continues to develop the person by giving them feedback. It also could be for diagnosis. For example, if you're not getting the deals, you know, what is it you're not doing or what behavior could we change? But it's expensive and it's time consuming. You can't usually do it all the time. Uh, now, in an instructional setting, in something like a simulation, you can certainly measure behavior. So it's a good thing to do, but it's not something you can do ongoing in most cases to see how things are working. We think work outputs are a big deal because you can count how many proposals good proposals or good hiring decisions or good widgets or what have you. Often there are permanent products or records of these things. And so you can monitor them. The other powerful part of that is if you're designing instruction, as I do, I, I deliver a lot of uh, virtual programs these days in the era of COVID where we've got sessions and we're measuring, uh, we're trying to look at how well people are learning. Now, if we define small outputs, in our case, things like good decisions, uh, descriptions of behavior, good descriptions of work outputs, uh, good descriptions of business results, um, good plans for how we're going to intervene. In other words, we can define these outputs. And during training, we can actually, if we give trainees opportunities to produce these small sub outputs, we can see how they're doing. And literally within the session or the next session, we can say, uh, these people aren't quite getting it yet because the output indicates the success of their behavior and they're not quite getting it yet. So we need to give them more feedback, more examples and so forth. So we could spend a lot of time in this, but what I believe is that this framework gives you a very robust way to look at what data are available and how we can practically measure uh, the impact of what we're doing. So let me kind of leave it at that. The only other thing I would mention is that there's a chapter that I uh, wrote some years ago for an ISPI book, I believe. And, uh, you know, maybe Guy can provide the reference to that, but uh, there's more detail. But anyway, that's the first point I would make about measurement. Um, the other thing is a completely different thing, but it is very much related to skills and knowledge. Or you could think of it as also a relation, uh, a performance, because we can talk about uh, fluent behavior. And this came out of really my history with B.F. Skinner and with other behavior scientists where Skinner's major contribution was what he called rate of response. In other words, how many times does an individual do something per unit of time, per minute, for example? And when we began using that in educational settings back in the 60s and early 70s, what we recognized is that you could see performance if you counted let's say the number of math facts a kid can get right in a minute, or the number of responses uh, that a uh, person can make in a practice activity of some kind, or the number of examples somebody can generate of work outputs in their environment, whatever it is, we can very sensitively look at um, the, what we call fluency, how not just accurately, but how easily, how smoothly can people perform. So this slide is sort of a way to describe what we call fluency that's based on a time-based measurement. It may just literally be accuracy plus speed. It may be simple cases like you're learning some facts with flashcards. How many flashcards can you get done in a minute correctly? Or how many items on a quiz or a test or whatever? And the quiz is an interesting example of that because everybody knows that multiple choice tests are incredibly insensitive. If you give people plenty of time to do a multiple choice test, they can guess, they can say, well, I know it's this one or that one. And then I think it's probably this one. So there's this whole time thing involved in guessing and figuring out a multiple choice test. Uh, and people who prepare for things like uh, standard uh, tests know about that. But if you give people, let's say three or four minutes with let's say 50 items, which is more than anybody could answer in that period of time, the number of correct responses they get where they say, yep, I know the answer, bing, bing, bing. 
is a very, very sensitive measure of how well people know something. So you can take a, a sort of everybody understands an insensitive way of measurement that is something like a multiple choice test, and you can add the time dimension to it and get a rather precise indication of that. We, we do things in customer call centers, for example, where we give people a whole list of things to find in the system. Let's say the uh, account, you know, so let's say the customer relationship management system, like find John Smith's account number, find Betty Jones service level, whatever it is, give them a whole list, give them five minutes and say, how many of these can you find? And we can practice that until people can very, very easily and quickly find that information, which is a big deal in the customer service environment. Now, the second thing on this slide, quality plus pace, is another way of thinking about this because there's some things we're not actually timing things. For example, if I'm trying to get a salesperson up to speed on responding to questions or objections, I don't want them to reel off the words at 130 words a minute. I want them to be able to cover, let's say, three or four key bullet points at their own pace, confidently, uh, smoothly at the same pace as they talk, let's say, to, about their grandmother or what have you. And so in that context, it's not just about speed, it's about pace. Just like dancing or skiing is more about the appropriate pace for doing something or playing music. And then we're also looking at quality of the response. So that's a way to look about fluency, at fluency too. It's a judgment call, but it's still a form of assessment or measurement. The third one is really just when we're talking about can people respond appropriately as needed. Um, I have a friend, for example, who was a um, who was a jet fighter pilot in the Swedish uh, Air Force. He's actually a performance improvement colleague now, but he was a Top Gun fighter pilot. And the, when he was learning to do this, the trainers would take him up in their jet. They'd put a mask on his eyes. They do a bunch of rolls and curls and stuff and go upside down. So he didn't have any idea where they were in space. They then hand over the controls to him, pull off the thing and see how fast he could uh, get the plane right, you know, and hopefully they were high enough. So if he lost control, they could fall a ways without crashing. But that's a great example of doing the right thing without hesitation. And in that case, again, you're looking at the time dimension, but it's for one thing. Or for example, if you have somebody whose job it is to intervene with disputes, might even be, let's say, in a prison or it might be in a special needs school, you need them to be able to smoothly move in, separate the combatants, sort it all out without hesitating. So that's another way to think about this fluency thing. And so what we say is that fluency is true mastery. And to look at it from a measurement point of view, um, you can think about performance as being in level. So in the beginning, you can't really do anything, you know, and then you go through some instruction and you get to what I would think of as beginner's level. And sad to say, this is what most training leaves people at. They can sort of do the thing. They probably don't make too many mistakes, but they're certainly not by any means fluent. And then years ago, there was a whole discussion about mastery learning, and it's still people, this shows up somewhat, but people said, no, we need people to be 100% correct before they move on. And people say, oh, that's kind of too rigid. You know, maybe 85% would be okay. But the point is there that no percent is it because that's just looking at accuracy. Of course, we want people to be accurate, but actual mastery is being able to do the thing correctly at the appropriate pace or speed, as we were saying earlier. And so the way you get that is through practice and through ergonomics, through designing an environment that people can move smoothly with. And if you just measure 100% correct, you can't see beyond that accuracy measure. You can't tell a difference between somebody who's masterful while speaking to a customer, having the customer yell in their ears and operating two or three different systems with somebody who's like, can sort of do all this, but slowly and hesitantly. You can't see that if you don't incorporate the time dimension. And there's a ramification of this for learning, which is based on the research that we and a lot of folks did, and you can learn more about it at the website fluency.org, but what we know and what you know if you think about it is that when you get truly fluent, when you get quick as well as accurate, you retain what you learn much better. You know, you don't forget how to ride a bike or whatever. Uh, you can do it for longer. Again, think about the first time you learned, let's say a new piece of software or something else. You were accurate, you could kind of move around it but man, you were hoping the phone would ring because it's kind of unpleasant after about 10 minutes. 
when you're fluent, it's no longer. You can do it easily. You can do it while watching the Super Bowl or whatever. And then application, same deal. What we've learned is when you're trying to put together a bunch of components, skills and knowledge into a single performance, if you can do those components easily and fluently, it comes together pretty easily. If you can't, it's the old throwing them in the deep end of the, of, of the, of the pool and struggling. So we know that this measurement of adding the time dimension not only is a more sensitive measurement, but it actually predicts these outcomes somewhat better. So that's pretty much the key things that I would, I would uh, wanna talk about. One is this notion that we can measure business results, work outputs, or behavior, and we should think about what the best combination of those are. And the second thing is that if we add the time dimension to our measures, we will have a far more sensitive and predictive approach to measurement. Carl, thank you so much for sharing your insights with us today. Thanks so much. Cheers. You're welcome. Thank you.